All right, good morning. Good morning. To you. Take your Bibles and turn to uh, Psalms chapter 142. Psalms chapter 142. And uh, pick up verse 4. Psalms 142, verse 4. Next week for Sunday school, I'm glad I remember this. Next week for Sunday school, we're going to do a question and answer. So, there's some people that asked if I could do another question and answer. And it's, it's been a few months, so I try to do it at least once every three months, and that's about how long it's been. So, uh, next week we'll be doing a question and answer Sunday school. So if you got any questions, you can remember to bring them up next week. Psalms 142, and uh, pick up verse 4. It says, I looked on my right hand and beheld, but there was no man that would know me. Refuge failed me. No man cared for my soul. No man cared for my soul. That's a great passage for soul winning, but this morning I want to go into a little bit more aiming it at the Christian. I want to ask you, how is your give-a-care? How is your give-a-care? And I don't know how great this outline or anything is. I might just sound more like I'm rambling on different things this morning, but I want to talk on the subject of caring. Caring. It's an awkward subject for me, one that I'm not real good with. <laughs> yeah. I mean, caring. I mean, the, I mean, the Christian should learn how to care for one another. Amen. They all, and if the Christian doesn't care for the lost, who will? Who will? If we don't care for them, who will? Yeah. Uh, we, we have to learn to care. And some, a lot of Christians, I believe, do care. People think, well, you don't care, you don't care, you just don't care. And they think that, and the reason being is they're not looking at things from a correct perspective. Just because somebody doesn't always show that they care doesn't mean that they don't care. And, uh, and that's one thing you learn as time goes by. Let's go to the Lord in prayer before we get started here. Lord, I pray that you'll take in a bless this message. I pray that you'll give me the right words to say. I tr- pray that you'll bless these words. I pray that you'll help someone here today. I pray that you'll help us to care more. I pray that you'll take in a help us to understand the importance of showing people that we do care. We care about their soul. We care about their conditions. We kept, care about their pain. And we care about their problems. We just don't always have the right words to say. We don't always have the ability to help. But we do care. Now I pray that we'll work on that in our lives. I believe it's something that always can be improved. And I pray that you'll help each and every one here where it won't be said that our give a care is broken. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen. When in a job, as you watch your fellow employees or even you watch yourself, you can come to a state of mind where either you're depressed or you're discouraged. You're in this place where you get into a place of self-pity. And many a times when you get there, it will show in your actions and in your works or what you're doing. And it shows up in the job many times. When you take a task on and you just get done, get done, I don't care. It shows. It shows. If you rebuild an engine and you just don't care, or you inspect a vehicle in your job and you just don't care, it will show. It's going to show up. Uh, The quality of work you do shows up. I mean, if... Brother Fred looked at my carpentry work. He'd say, I just don't care about carpentry. Why? Because I'm so bad at it. Okay? I mean, it's not that I don't care. I just don't have the skills when it comes to carpentry. Now, when I look at his carpentry, he cares about stuff. And carpentry, I'm like, 
that guy's a perfectionist. And he says, oh, this is such a terrible job. This is a bad job. This. I'm like, I don't know what eyes you're looking at it from because it looks great to me. But it's the, the different perspectives change. I'll tell you, when it comes to giving a care, sometimes we don't have the perspective that the other person has. So we think they don't care. Perspectives can be different. Uh, just because our perspective isn't their perspective does not mean that they don't care. But there is a danger sometimes with us where we can come to a state where we just don't care. Where we just don't care. And, uh, and when that happens, we have a phrase for that. We say, their give a care is broken. Their give a care is broken. And... Uh, and everything, I mean, the Bible says, whatsoever ye do, ye do heartily as unto the Lord and not unto men. And if you could do that all the time, your give a care would never be broken. And uh, whether it's a child being given a chore to do that they don't want to do, or it's us at work or dealing with somebody, the more you care about something, the better you're going to do it. Or the better you're going to try to do it. If you actually care. And when it comes to one another, we should care. That way we could take and address one another the way that we should. I mean, when it comes to your family, you should care. Amen? When it comes to your kids, you shouldn't never get to a point where you just don't care. And sometimes we build that front or that wall of protection about us. And we'll say, we'll make this statement. Well, I don't care. And you say, what is it? That's a wall of protection because we don't like the direction it's going and we're trying to build that wall so we won't be hurt. Have you ever actually figured out why you say that? I just don't care. I, I, I don't care what's going on in politics. Uh, yeah, you do. Otherwise, you wouldn't have said that. <laughs> you do care. I mean, maybe not enough to really let it consume you, but you do that as a protection because you realize there's nothing you can do to stop it. Okay? You, know, you see the direction your kids are going after they've grown and left the house, and you just say, well, I don't care what you do. Yeah, you do. Yeah, you do. What is that? You're trying to build a wall so you don't get hurt. Because the more you care about something, the more likely that thing may hurt you if it don't go the way that you want it to go. Children are very much that way. Especially when they get old. And, uh, and you see that time and time again. So don't go to the point in the Christian life where you say, well, I just don't care. Truth is, we do care. We do care. And some people might think that we don't care because they don't see the reactions in our life that they expect us to see. I want to give you some points, first of all, why some people think we don't care. First of all, some people think we don't care because we have got our own burdens. We have not yet got our own burdens under control. Take your Bible and turn to Galatians chapter 6. And look at verse 2. When it comes to helping people, a lot of times you cannot help somebody unless your life is into a position where you have the ability to help them. And if you're trying to get things under control in your own life, it's hard for you to show care toward them. I'll, I'll show you why. Look at Galatians chapter 6, pick up verse 2. It says, Bear ye one another's burdens, and so fulfill the law of Christ. Now that's a great place to be where you can bear one another's burdens. Where you can sit there and help them out. You're in a position to help them out. And you can show them the law of Christ by helping them out. You can love them the way you should, and love them and be able to help them and do things for them, take care of them, that's a great place to be. But keep reading in the chapter there, in verse 3, it says, For if a man think himself to be something, when he is nothing, he deceiveth himself. 
But let every man prove his own work, and then shall he have rejoicing in himself alone and not another. For every man shall bear his, what? his own burden. Well, I thought it said bearing you one another burdens. How are you supposed to bear your own burden? Well, if you're not bearing your own burden, how can you bear someone else's burden? And that's the situation. You have to get to a point where you are bearing your own burden. You know, a lot of times we get in positions where we can't bear someone else's burden because we're overburdened. And we haven't took all our burdens and cast them away. I was, I just recently, we were up at preacher's meeting up in Columbia Falls on Friday, and coming back that night, the transmission went out in my Explorer. I was talking, I think, to uh, Brother Martinez. He says, well, it's a good thing you're a mechanic. You can rebuild that transmission. I told I think I'm just going to discard the car because I don't want to fool with the time. It's not really the money. It's not the skill. I just ain't got the time to deal with it. I've had, I mean, when my truck locked up, that was about three years ago, it's still sitting in the back. I got people coming up to me. I had a guy this week, while we were gone Friday, knock on the door and ask to buy my truck because he's been sitting at, seeing it sit there for so long. He wants to know if I'll sell it. <laughs> like, my, I have big plans of rebuilding the thing and maybe giving it to him, but he'll be 40 by the time I get it done. <laughs> I mean, it's a, you know, <laughs> and I look at this, yeah, I know how to do it. I can get the parts. I can rebuild it. I just don't want to take the time it's going to consume off of what things that I think is more important. And let me tell you, you can, you're not going to help people out until you simplify your life. Because what you're going to find is, you're going to find you have so many burdens to carry yourself that there's no way you can stop and help someone else and take the time for them. And it's not that you don't care. You do. It's just you have a whole bunch of stuff you've got to take care of before you can take care of them. I can't feed somebody else until I can feed them. Amen? I, I, I mean... I mean, there's certain things you have to be able to do for yourself. You have to be able to carry your own burden before you can carry someone else's. The Christian life is about others. But you can't help others unless you have your own life under control. You've got to get to a place where you can help people. And uh, take your Bible and turn to... uh, 1 Corinthians chapter 9. 1 Corinthians chapter 9. Pick up verse 27. 1 Corinthians chapter 9, verse 27. There's some things we have to get under control in our own lives before we can help other people get them under control in their lives. Amen? Amen. I mean, you've got to get some things under control. Look at 1 Corinthians chapter 9, pick up verse 25. It says, And every man that striveth for the mastery is temperate in all things. Temperate means he's seasoned, he's got it under control. It's at the right temperature, you could say. Uh, in all things. Now they do it to obtain the cro- a corruptible crown, but we an incorruptible If therefore we run, not uncertainly, so fight I not as one that beateth the air. But I keep under my body and bring it into subjection, that lest by any means, when I have preached to others, I myself should be a castaway. In other words, I can't tell you how to live the Christian life until I get the Christian life controlled where I'm living it right myself. And many preachers will make that mistake. They'll make the mistake where they're studying some sin and some sin and they preach to their congregation, don't do this sin, don't do this sin. And then they go out and they do the exact same thing themselves. What happened? They became the castaway. They did not take time to get control of themselves. You know, sometimes I have to break away. I, I, I enjoy going to a preacher's meeting because I just want to be preached at myself. I enjoy being preached to. 
I, I need preaching. I need to be preached at. And, uh, and that's uh, sometimes you have to take and learn to minister to oneself so you can minister to someone else. I mean, there, there comes a point in time where you've got to spend some time with God so you can get something from God so you can give it to someone else. You know, many a times when I preach to you or I teach to you, I'm preaching and teaching you something that I got from God by reading in the book that the Lord gave me. And that's, I'm just feeding you what the Lord fed me. Amen? I mean, that many a times that's the way it works. And uh, we have to take in, first of all, we've got to get our burdens under control before we can show our care to others. And it's not that you don't care, it's just you have to get your burdens under control. Here's somebody that they want me to pay their rent. How can I pay their rent if I can't pay my own? It's nice that they ask, but I mean, I, I had one guy once accused me of being a mega church. <laughs> he didn't know me. It was on them one of those social websites. <laughs> like, well, <laughs> like you, you, you're barking up the wrong tree here, man. <laughs> Just, <laughs> but, uh, but, but, I mean. I mean, yeah, there's some things where you sit there and you look at some of these uh, mega churches and you say, why can't they help us? Why can't they do this? You know, some mega churches, they got bigger problems than what we got. I mean, they might be a mega church, but they might have a mega debt too. <laughs> I mean, you know, that's a, some of them get built that way. And uh, so, so there's always perspectives and you know if they have a mega debt they can't help you with your pro financial problems they can they got to get their burden under control they got to get their debt paid first before they can help you why don't you help us build a church because they're millions in debt on the building that they built now how they got that well, well that's their business that's between them and God Maybe they took one of them steps of faith, you know, and hoping they took the right step. But, but I mean, that's the way it works where you can't always help somebody until you get your own problems under control. I mean, can, can I go give somebody marriage counseling if my marriage is falling apart and I ain't got it under control? How does that work? It doesn't work. It doesn't work. Take your Bible and turn to 1 Timothy chapter 3 and verse 5. 1 Timothy chapter 3 and verse 5. This gives a principle of the importance of this, especially in a preacher's life, but it works in your life too if you're going to counsel or help somebody. This is a standard rule that you need to apply to oneself. The Bible says in 1 Timothy 3, 5, it says, For if a man know not how to rule his own house, how shall he take care of the church of God? Uh, I, you know, and what's it say? It's saying, you got to have things under control at home. you got to have things control over at home. I'll tell you, I can't help you if I'm neglecting my children because it's a sin for me to neglect my children. Have you ever thought about that? Yep. You ever thought about that? You know, you know why some preacher's kids go bad? Because a preacher never had time for his own family. He's always spending his time at the church. With the church. Things in the church. That's convicting to me. That's convicting. You say, well, what is... Uh, it's kind of like this. I, I have a very good chance to produce a real good disciple for Jesus Christ. It's four young children that I have in my home all the time. Because I got them a little bit more than I got y'all. I got a little bit more influence over them than I have over you. Amen? Now why can't I just look at them as that is part of my ministry. Am I? I got an opportunity to raise somebody for Christ. 
And, uh, and that's, uh, that's something, it's a perspective that if you get that under control, if you get your burdens under control, you can bear one another's burdens also. So sometimes the reason people don't see that we care is because we're trying to get our own burdens under control to a point where we can bear someone else's burdens. Amen. Amen. And that, that, that rule goes in many different ways. Many different ways. Number two, some people think we don't care because they are seeking our help in a place that we will not approach. They're seeking our help in a place where we can't approach them. They've made themselves unapproachable and unhelpable from us. Uh, I'll give you a good example of this. Turn in your Bible to Luke chapter 15. Pick up verse 11. Luke chapter 15, verse 11. Here is a great example. Luke chapter 15, verse 11 says, And he said, A certain man had two sons. And the younger of them said to his father, Give me of the portion of the goods that falleth to me. And he divided unto them his living. Not many days after that, the younger son gathered all together and took his journey into a far country. And there wasted his substance with righteous living. And when he had spent all, there arose a mighty famine in that land, and he began to be in want. And he went and joined himself to a citizen of that country, and he sent him into the fields to feed swine. And he would fain have filled his belly with the husk that the swine did eat, and no man gave unto him. And when he came to himself, he said, How many hired servants of my father have bread enough and spare, and I perish with hunger? Now let me tell, ask you something. Do you think the father did not care about this young man? Sure, the father still cared. He cared. Did the father have the ability to help him? Yeah, I mean, you can't use the excuse that the father wasn't bearing his own burdens and couldn't bear his. He had the ability to help. The father cared. But the young man was in a place where the father couldn't approach. The young man had to come to where he could be helped. He had to. Many people will call me and call the church phone wanting me to pay their rent. They're wanting me to buy them food. Some wants me to buy diapers. Many want me to fill their gas tank. <laughs> Amen. Or whatever the financial need is that they're wanting for me to materially materialistically provide for their needs, they're calling this church wanting me to do that for them. You know what I will ask them many times, I'll say, where do you go to church at? I don't, I had one tell me they came to church here. It's like, been a pastor for five years, I'll remember that. <laughs> you know, I mean, that was, <laughs> he showed up one time ten years ago, and they're a member here. <laughs> I mean, that's, uh, you know, that's, but, uh, well, I'll ask them that, and the reason I ask them that is, one, if they tell me they're going to church, they're like, well, what does your pastor say? Why ain't your pastor helping you? But the one thing I'm trying to point out to them, and the Holy Spirit shows this, you're calling me for help, but you won't darken the door of this church and come hear the preaching and the teaching of the Word of God, which is what this church is for and what we do. That's why we're here. And if I can't give them the Word of God and I just pay their rent, buy their bills, pay their diapers and give them money in their bank or put gas in, and I can't teach them the Word of God, I've done them no good. I haven't helped them any. And, uh, and I know that, but they don't know that. And for them to truly have me bear their burdens or help them bear their burdens, it would be better if they were here on Sunday morning sitting through the services getting something from God. It's not that I'm against bearing their burdens or helping them. 
I'm not. I'm not. I mean, we try to help people when it comes up, when the time comes up. I, I believe in helping people. And, uh, and I'm willing to help people financially. I just don't want to waste the Lord's money on somebody that is living out in the hog pen. I don't want to support their righteous living. I mean, before I grew in grace when I was a young man, I remember I was straight preaching in Chicago one time. And this fella comes up to me and he goes, I, I, need, uh, I need 20 bucks for a motel room. First of all, there's no motel room in Chicago that you can get for 20 bucks. <laughs> I mean, I, I know that. <laughs> okay. So said, I need 20 bucks for my motel room. Will you spare me 20 bucks? Well, at that time, I mean, I, I was living on scraps. I mean, I was nine, uh, 20 years old, fresh out of, away from home. I had a car that I was jumping in and out of the window because I couldn't buy the parts to fix it. And, uh, you know, Dukes of Hazard comes to Chicago. They didn't know what to do with me. <laughs> and uh, and, this, and uh, I, I, so, I mean, I wasn't exactly a wealthy person, but they see this guy straight preaching. I mean, in the name of Christ, they figure you're going to give him money. That's their attitude. Now, he came to the wrong guy at that time. He walked up to me and he asked, well, can I give I said, did you just walk up to me? I said, yeah. I said, you got two good feet. I said, raise one hand. He raised one hand. I said, now raise your left hand. Right hand, left hand, whichever hand. He raised both his hands. I said, mister, you got two good feet, you got two good hands, and your mind works good enough to give me that story. Go get a job. <laughs> and uh, and the, one, the one guy, the one, there was several guys with me. One guy's jaw dropped. Couldn't believe I said that. The other guy broke out laughing. And we started uh, going, got in the car, started driving. And then the story starts coming together with the different Christians that was out on the street corner. Well, one guy, he came up, he has asked him for food. He said, I'll take you down to the mission. They'll give you food and place to stay. He says, no, I don't like their food. Turned them down. The other guy gave him 20 bucks. That's the guy whose jaw dropped. <laughs> He's like, I can't believe you said that to him. And I was like, well, I can't believe you gave him 20 bucks. <laughs> I mean, he's just going to go get his next hit or bottle. I mean, I, and that's probably what he did. Don't you realize that's what they do? There's a reason they're in the condition that they're in. And usually drugs and alcohol are involved. And it's not that I don't care. It's not that I don't care. But I know money isn't the answer to all their problems. I know what they're asking for isn't the answer. If they would come and they'd sit and hear the gospel again, the word of God, and learn how to turn their life around and trust God and let God guide them through life and live by the Bible that would be far richer than any material blessing I could ever give them. If I could get them to just learn the Word of God and accept Jesus Christ as their Savior. I care. I care for their soul immensely. I'd love to get them saved. I'd love to get their life turned around. I'd love to get them back up on their feet. I'd love to do it. They don't want that. They don't want it. They're unapproachable for me. They're in a place where I cannot approach them. There is a difference in caring for someone and joining with them also. The father didn't go down to the hog pen and enjoy the husk with them. That's one thing you got to learn by a Christian. Just, oh, you, won't, you don't care about us. You never go out to the bar with us. You never do this. You never do that. You never go hang around with us and stuff. There's a difference between caring and joining. And when you deal with people at work, the lost, you better realize there's a difference between caring them about them and joining them. There's a difference. It 
Some people think we don't care because we don't have the opportunity or ability to show the care. We don't have the opportunity. Look at Philippians chapter 4. Pick up verse 10 and 11. It says, But I rejoiced in the Lord greatly, that now at least your care of me hath flourished again. Wherein ye were also careful, but ye lacked, what? Opportunity. But ye lacked opportunity. Not that I speak in respect of one, for I have learned in whatsoever state I am, earth to be content. What did that have to do? That had to do with them giving to Paul financially to support them. That's, that's what it's talking about. I'll tell you, sometimes we have missionaries come through and we can't support them as a church. We can give them a little bit of love offering, help them along as they're on deputation. And many a times I'll ask for their prayer letters so I can pray for them and continue to pray for them and see if there a problem rises in their ministry. Like I've asked you all to pray for Brother Russell down in Mexico. He's a guy that came by here many years ago and presented his work. We didn't take him on for support, but he's one that I, his prayer letters come to me in an email. And uh, I'm more than happy to pray for him, and he needs your prayers right now. He needs your prayers. But uh, financially, we do not have the ability to support. I wish we could support every missionary that comes by here $500 a month. I wish we could. I would love to. We don't have the opportunity to do that. We don't have the ability to do that. And there is a practical... I mean, right now, let me tell you something. I am not... I mean, uh, I sent my son to help the divorce, and he got divorced, he helped brother divorce with a bunch of wet wood at his house. He said, would you like to go help him? Sure, I'd like to go help him. I've been on ibuprofen for four days because of my back. I know what would help happen if I went and helped them. You know, now he's got a good back; he can do that. But 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 you get the idea. Sometimes there's something that you do not have the ability to do. I mean, I need some. I need a house built. I'm not going to ask Judy Cagle to go do it. <laughs> I mean, it's, she doesn't have the ability to do that. You know? I mean, you, you, you see what I mean, and sometimes you don't have the ability to do what needs to be done to help someone. So not everything is because we don't care. Sometimes it's because we can't show that we care. We don't have that ability. So how do we check ourselves whether or not we actually do have a care about others and decide whether or not we should increase our care? Because I don't want to just give you their perspective of us. I want to give you a perspective of yourself to examine yourself to decide whether or not you truly do care. Or you should increase your care. First of all, some of the fruits of showing that you care is number one, do you think about them? Do you think about them? Psalms chapter 40, verse 16 and 17, it says, Let all those that seek thee rejoice and be glad in thee. Let us such as love thy salvation say continually, the Lord be magnified. But I am poor and needy, Yet the Lord thanketh upon me. Thou art my help and my deliverer. Make no tearing, O my God. He says, I'm poor and needy. Yet the Lord thanketh upon me. You know, that's an amazing thing when you think about it. There's a preacher that preached a message up there Friday. And uh, he preached this message on how big God is and how great God is. And he went into all these things about the cosmos and how huge these stars were and how some of them are so much bigger than our, st our sun and so much bigger than the earth. And he's going and showing how big the universe is. And he had all the scientific details I can't give you, but it was quite impressive, some of the stuff that he said. 
He, he told us, me, us that the biggest, if the earth was a golf ball, and the biggest star that they found was compared to the earth, it'd be, t- it'd be taking a golf ball and put in two inches over the state of Texas, and that's how big that star was. That's mind-boggling. That blows you away. That's humongous. Isn't that what he said? Ain't that what he said? I get my details right here. <laughs> but, but I mean, that, that just blows me away. And the God that made that just spoke that in the existence. He thinks upon me and you. We're, we're like this little atom compared to him in size. This speck, and he thinks about us. Do we care? Let no man say, no man care. Never let it be said that no man cared for my soul. Do you think about them? Does it come across your mind? Do you wonder about them? Do you wonder about the brethren? Do you wonder about somebody you haven't seen a long time? If you think about them, it shows that you care about them. How often did Paul, when he wrote a letter... Say, salute this brother, salute this brother. What's he doing? He's thinking about him. Cares. Just the simple task of letting nobody, somebody know that you're thinking about them shows that you care. And I'll tell you, it means a lot too. It means a lot to a person. Just a simple task to let somebody know that you care, think about them. Number two, do you pray for them? There's a little bit more when you care a little bit more when you don't just think about somebody, but you pray for somebody. Paul says in 1 Thessalonians 3.10, Night and day, praying exceedingly that we might see your face and might perfect that which is lacking in your faith. Night and day he prayed for these guys. I have a friend, he says he prays for me and the kids every day. I always feel guilty because I pray for him maybe once a month. I don't know. I mean, when I think about him, I pray for him. And it says, do I pray for you every day? No, I don't. I'm sorry. I I hope I don't ruin your expectations, but no, I don't pray for you every day. I mean, some days it's all I can do to get the coffee in, get the, uh, the chapters read, get to work and get home. I mean, I get a shower and I'm done. Worn out, okay? So I don't always, every day, night and day, pray for you. I I hope you don't feel bad about that. It's not that I don't care. And that that convicts me some. Do you pray for them? I, I will say this, I pray for each and every one of you. I'll think about you and I'll pray for you. I do do that. I just can't say I do it every day. I'd be lying. I'd be lying if I said that. But do you pray for them? Does an individual come to your mind that you pray for? Is there people at your work that you want to see me saved? Do you pray for them? The fact that you pray for them shows that you care. Do you pray for them? Number three, will you make time for them? Now this is going a little bit farther. One, you think about them. Two, you pray for them. Then you make time for them. Not do you have time for them. Do you make time for them? I'll tell you, sometimes when you care about somebody enough, you're going to make time for them. And, and, and that's what we have to do. Time is a very precious thing. It's something that disappears very quickly. It's hard for us to find the time. But when you care about some of you, somebody, you have to sit there and say, you know what, I'm going to stop. I'm going to make some time for that individual. I'm going to make the time to spend with that individual. I mean, I got thinking, uh, I ran into Brother Bemis uh, up there in Columbia Falls, and I told him, I need to get by and visit you. I'd like to see your wife. Because I got thinking, you know, I don't think I've visited her 
them since I went there with you. Actually, it was the last time I went there, the last time I went and seen him was the weekend of when he had that big anniversary. Sean's crib was there. That was the last time I was at his house. That was the last time I seen Sister Beans. That's been, that's been, I think it's been over a year. It's over a year since I've dropped in and seen them. Does that mean I don't care? No, I just haven't made the time. You have to take time to go spend with somebody. You have to take the time. I'll tell you, I mean, y'all made time to fix my camper. That's, I know that that took some time. They put some time into that thing. That shows something. That, that's, that's, that strikes me. Thank you for taking that time. That's taking some time. And uh, when you take some time for somebody, it shows you they care. Mark chapter 6, the apostles went out witnessing. and when they came back, the Lord says, you're tired. Let's take some time and set ourselves apart in a place where there is nobody. Let's take some time. The Lord took some time to spend with His disciples alone. He took that time. I mean, uh, can you, let, me, let me tell you this. You're not going to have a real good relationship with your wife if you don't take some time. If you never see her, never take time, always gone. Boy, honey, I care. See you next month. <laughs> I mean, that's a... Yeah, we'll, we'll see how that works. <laughs> you know, <laughs> yeah, she's not going to feel that you care that much. I mean, I, I got an, a guy at work. I want to take and get by and see him. Oh, I got to make that time. I got to open up that time and go see him. I got to make it. I got to make the time. And you got to find out how important it is, how much you want to show that you care about somebody, and make the time. So let me ask you. Do you make time for some people? Do you make time? I know you can't make time for everyone. I know you can. I, I know you can't take and go visit everybody for a week. Doesn't work. I haven't been to Tennessee for probably five years. We want to go back for a week. We want to take some time. But you have to make that time. You have to sit there and say, hey, I'm, gonna, well, I'm not going to work this week. I'm, they're going to have to hire somebody else. And, <laughs> I mean, it's a, you know, you have to make the time. You have to force it to happen. Do you make time for God? Do you make time for God? I, that's a good question. How much time do you make for Him? Depending on how much you care about somebody, will tell you how much time you'll make. Last of all, I'm going to end with this one. I'm going to wrap this up. Do you care enough to tell them what they need to hear? Do you care enough to tell them what they need to hear? In 2 Kings chapter 7, and verse 9, it says, Then said one... Then they said one to another, We do not well this day is a day of good tidings, and we hold our peace. If we tarry till the morning light, some mischief will fall upon us. Now the ones that said that were some lepers that had been cast out of the city. And the city was besieged, and the city of Samaria was besieged. It had been besieged for a long time. And there was such a drought in the city that they were getting some pretty good money for... Uh, doves dung and donkey heads, and uh, that's what the. If I mean, if you was rich, you got old donkey's head, and if you were poor, you were eating dung's dung. Dung. I, I, that's pretty low estate, and they were so bad at that time that they were eating their own children. And they took these leopards and they had cast them out because they had leprosy, and I guess being a leopard meant you were pretty safe because even the attacking armies didn't want to come near you. 
And they said, you know what, let's go to the camp of the Assyrians and let's see if we can find mercy and get some food. So they had these leopards go and the Assyrians had fled and stuff and all that they'd left everything. The Lord had wrong fear of them and they'd just took it off and they're finding all these tents empty and stuff. And they're gorging themselves and filling themselves and these outcast leopards who had been cast out, nobody cared about them, said, we do not well if we do not tell. They stopped and they said, nobody may care about us, but we should care. We should care. And they go and they tell what they found. And the leopards cared. They, and they cared about those that had even cast them out of their city. They cared. Let me tell you something as a Christian. It's hard for you to say that you care about somebody's soul if you've never told them about the saving grace of Jesus Christ. How can you say you care if, you never, if you've never left them a track, if you've never took and took the opportunity to say, hey, do you know about Jesus Christ that He died for your sins? You say, well, they'll mock me. Yeah, they probably will. But do you care enough about them where you don't care if they mock you or not? How much do you care? In Ezekiel chapter 3, Let's close with this. Ezekiel chapter 3, verse 17. It says, Son of man, I have made thee a watchman unto the house of Israel. Wherefore, hear the word at my mouth and give them warning from me. When I say unto the wicked, Thou shalt surely die, and thou givest him not warning, nor speakest to warn the wicked from his wicked way to save his life, the same wicked man shall die in his iniquity. But his blood will I require at thine hand. Yet if thou warn the wicked, and he turn from his wickedness, nor from his wicked way, he shall die in his iniquity, but thou hast delivered thy soul. Now I understand this is Old Testament context, but the perspective is the same. Unless you warn them, they're not going to be saved. And the only reason that you would not warn somebody from danger is because you don't care. You don't care. I'll tell you, you see somebody walking into a place of danger, what do you do? You, normally you try to warn them. You try to warn them. Why? Because you care. You don't want them to get hurt. Yeah, I mean, you ever see somebody go into a danger and say, hey, I'm giving you a warning. Why do you give the warning? You give the warning because you care. Never let it be said that no man cared for my soul. Do you give them a warning? How much do you care? How much do you care? I'll tell you, if you never give warning, you don't care enough. If you never give the warning, you don't care enough. That's a good way to check to see if we care. One, do we think about them? Two, do we pray for them? Three, do we make time for them? Four, do we warn them when there's danger? All right, let's have a song of invitation.